Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back again to another episode of As I Live and Grieve. I know, I'm going to say it again. I say it every week. You're going to love our guest. With me today is Alexandra Wyman, and she has written a book about a particular facet of grief that we often feel we need to kind of put our head, tuck it down into our shoulders and speak very, very quietly about. The title of her book is called The Suicide Club. So that will give you just a little teaser, if you will, of what we're going to talk about. So welcome, Alexandra. Thanks so much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm so delighted to be here today. Great. It's my absolute pleasure and honor to have you with us. I'm enthralled by your book at this point, and I know our listeners will be too before this episode is finished. So before we actually get started with questions and a little bit more information on your topic, Would you just give our listeners a little bit of your background, please? Absolutely. Um, So I currently I live in the state of Colorado in the U.S., since I know there might be some international listeners. And um, I grew up kind of moving around in a a Russian ethnic home. And I uh, by the time I graduated high school, I really bought into that idea of you go to college, you meet a partner, you buy a house, you get married, you have your 2.5 children, your three dogs, and white picket fence. Um, And that is not how things went for me at all. So I, after college, traveled quite a bit. Even like, I'm one of those stereotypical people who I'm not doing anything with my college degree that I studied, even though I did enjoy what I was studying. And took time off. I was that one, I'm the youngest in my family, and I was that one who just could not settle down. And then In about 2011, I decided to come back to Colorado, and I was already in my 30s by that point in time, still not married, no white picket fence, no children. Um, In fact, I had cats at that time, not even dogs, and decided I would go get my master's. So I went and got my master's degree in occupational therapy, which is still what I do now. Uh, And then I ended up on, like, whirlwind decided I was done trying to find a partner, done trying to fit into this life that I thought really showed me how successful things would be and um, ended up meeting Sean and we just had this whirlwind romance I mean we just clicked right away we had a soul connection and we were engaged very quickly we got married eight months after we met we bought our house right away then I found out I was pregnant I mean I was checking off the boxes of how life is quote, mm-hmm. supposed to go, mm-hmm. finally was going to make my parents proud, everything's good. <laughs> uh, and then four days before our second wedding anniversary, Sean disappeared and ended up dying by suicide. Wow. And our son had just turned one. And in one instant, everything, that whole beautiful, ideal life just became one big, massive pile of rubble. And... That's how I'm here with you today, um, Kathy, is being able to, uh, I, I took that experience and realized for me, I, I had so, so, such beautiful like widow's journals and prayer books that were sent to me, um, but nothing really got to the root of your life is a pile and mm-hmm. how do you start to rebuild it? Right. right. So I just started jotting down notes and decided I don't want someone else to go through this the way I feel I'm going through this. And I've always loved writing. Um, So I decided to just put it all down and it ended up being a book, which I never thought that I would be a published author or have a best-selling book or be doing this Mm -hmm. today. But Mm -hmm. if there's one way that I can help another person through their process, that's how I landed here with you. Well, um, it's going to sound really trite for me to say, I feel blessed that your path has crossed mine. It's terrible that it has to be due to such devastating facets of life, so to speak. 
But you address that later in the book, and I will I will get to that too because this is a coincidence that you probably won't even believe. So back to your book for the moment. Mm-hmm. When you hear the title "The Suicide Club," I mean immediately you have an idea of what this book is about. What you don't expect is the genuineness, I think, that you've told your story. And along with that feeling that you mentioned as you were speaking about your background, along with that feeling that you don't want anyone to go through that, I think you've made every word count. So don't ever worry about thinking about wanting to be a writer. You are a writer. I always judge that by the reader's perspective. And I know I read lots and lots of books about a lot of subjects, some fiction, some nonfiction. And obviously with this podcast, I read a lot of books about grief. There are very few books. I can probably count them on one hand with five fingers. And yours is now one of those five that I would recommend to someone who is in that very initial phase of grief. So for me, you're right up there with Megan Devine's It's Okay That You're Not Okay. Because this is one, you're very blunt. I'll use the word blunt. You're very (laughs) to the point. This is the way it is. But it's with a purpose because you want that person to know that you know how they feel if they're reading your book. I've never experienced the loss of someone I love, anyone I love, choosing death by suicide. I've, I've not experienced that. I know how devastating my own personal grief journey is and has been. It must be incredibly more so to go through that. And I think one of the first emotions that I've heard about, and I would think would be the first one to come, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is, did you feel any guilt Oh, absolutely. And I still do. Do you? Still? (laughs) It comes and goes. I, there are times, and it shifts and changes, just like the grief process does. Mm -hmm. I still have times that I reflect and go, could I have done something differently? Um, Could I have been a different wife? Could I have worked on my own insecurities? Um, and, And let me be clear, when I say that I evaluate these things, I know that my marriage is not the reason Sean died. I think the stresses in our marriage at that time contributed to his overall choice, but it was Mm -hmm. not there. There was a long, long history of a lot of stress without having healthy coping skills Mm -hmm. and good stress management. And I think it, that's where it compounded. Um, But I do have, I do still have those questions. And of course, I don't know if I had made different choices throughout the whole process. I mean, he, he went missing for about six hours. So Mm -hmm. And I knew right away what was happening. Um, so I, I was, you know, desperately trying to get in touch with him and other people. Um, so I still wonder what I could have done differently, knowing that that may not have changed the outcome. Right. When you're, when you're struck with that sensation again of guilt, even at this point in your journey, is there something you do to try to pull yourself out of it or to distract yourself, so to speak? When that happens, I tend to remind myself to shift his death away from me and being about me and to being about him. Okay. And what I mean by that is for someone to make a decision or to get to a point where the only choice they feel that's left to end their pain is to end their life, that's a pretty big decision. And that would be, in my opinion, an insurmountable amount of pain. And when I can shift shift it back to the fact that he was in that much emotional pain, and again, this is my hypothesis. This is my lived experience. So mm-hmm. I don't really actually have the answers. This is just right, how I've right. decided to, to work through it. But then it kind of alleviates some of that guilt and stress on me and puts it back, he had a choice. Right. And it wasn't my job to save him, even though I tried and lots mm-hmm. of people tried. And and that helps me just changing that mindset. And I also use other tools. Sometimes I journal okay. um, or meditate to try and reflect on that. 
Um, but that helps me really kind of shift that guilt a little bit and remind myself I did, I made choices based on the information that I had at the time, just as he made a choice based off of information he had at the time. And I don't agree with his choice, uh, but I do recognize that it was his choice. Okay. Along with the death of someone we love by suicide, sometimes comes a stigma. Again, I read, I hear, I've not personally experienced. Did you experience any of that stigma in your community, whether it's friends, family, that you felt people were avoiding you or people felt a little more, a little more sympathy or whatever? Um, but I, I think you know what I mean when I say the word stigma. Yes. And I, and I experienced it in, in a couple different ways. So first, I did experience some stigma in the sense of people almost projecting their ideas about suicide onto my situation. So mm-hmm. the um, you know permanent solution to a temporary problem or how he must have been depressed, which means I must be an expert in mental illness now, or where were the signs? Did I have, you know, why didn't I do anything about the sign? Um, and I'll say when it comes to those things, I, I, don't believe there really are signs um, mm-hmm. in my experience and with the people that I've right. I've met and been around. But that that's one part of it. And the other part of it that I'll say is absolutely people are, are going to try and create space from something tragic that happens in themselves as a form of safety and trying to somehow believe that something so tragic can't happen to them. So there was some of that um, stigma of it, it must have been something in my marriage um, I must have said something personally to him that drove him over the edge. Um, that really came out a little bit more. And I did feel that my marriage and our life was, was kind of out in display. I, I right. say it's open, it was open season yeah. um, where people could, you know, start evaluating. And it's, and it's all our idea of trying to find what that rational explanation is for something that's so irrational. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did, did you find that, whether it's is it's your own personal thoughts of guilt or whatever, in addition to the stigma from others you might encounter, did you feel more isolated? Did you stay at home more? Or were you still able to get yourself out there and move forward? So kind of both. I think initially I did feel more isolated. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was so people that you think are going to have your back and support you don't necessarily. And that's just their own journey with the grief. And then other people that you don't imagine would be there for you are. And so initially I did, I was, I did feel isolated and my situation was a little complicated by some of the reactions of other family and friends. So staying kind of at home and isolated helped me feel more safe until I could emotionally feel safe enough to handle situations around uh, I, I did find that like our son ended up kind of being my anchor. He was the reason that I needed to get out of bed right. and doesn't necessarily mean I did very much when I got out of bed, but right. I knew that I had to try and start taking very small steps forward. And that took me a while to, to wrap my head around and start to do. Um, Cause I, at, you know, I was bewildered at first mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. how am I even supposed to do this? This is, not at all what I was expecting or thinking life would be like. Right. Um, right. And then once I could do that, I did find about seven weeks after Sean died is I started going to a suicide specific support group. Mm -hmm. I started seeing a therapist um, and that kind of helped me encourage me. And I love that the people I was around met me where I was and were able to just help support me and be right right next to me. Good. in order to allow me to start taking steps forward. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I, I hear a lot that children become your anchor. And and even five years ago when I lost my husband, my, my daughters were my anchors, even then. And they were adults, but they were still my anchors, you know. And I knew that regardless of anything else, that, that I had the two of them that I had to... I had to get up and get moving. I, I, you know, I, I it wasn't going to be this person who just stayed in the house and didn't go anywhere because that's not what they'd want me to be, you know? So uh, 
children are, are wonderful for that aspect of it. I want to segue over, well, not really a segue, it's an actual switch, to something you mentioned in your book, the movie Collateral Beauty. Mm-hmm. There's the coincidence. About three weeks ago, I belonged to a, a, a group on Facebook called the Global Grief Network. They're therapists, educators around the world, and I'll give you the information later because you might enjoy the collaboration. But I met someone there who was working on a book about collateral beauty. <laughs> I know, you guys can't see my face, but it's just really. I, I wow. know. But, yeah. I mean, so, you know, I kind of listened and everything, and then he mentioned the movie Collateral Beauty. Well, I had watched that movie when it came out years ago. And I thought, well, maybe I better go back and look at it again because, you know, that sounds a little more profound than I remember it being. So I went back and I watched the movie again and I was enthralled about this whole concept. And I thought, that's that's what happened to me. Because in a lot of ways, I found the littlest detail made me smile where before it never made me, it never would have made me, I would have disregarded it completely. But all of a sudden, this little, a butterfly you know, the silliest thing, a baby duck, you know, who knows what it was. So um, this gentleman and I have, have talked several times since then. And I told him that I rewatched the movie and everything. And just, it was like a whole new concept, a whole new perspective opened up to me. And then when I read that on your, it was on your press release. And then when I found the area in the book that it talked about it and everything, I said, <gasps> I can't wait to tell Alexandra this, you know, because here's this coincidence. It's this just came into my life. Let's talk about collateral beauty. Tell me about it. How did it hit you? I just, I love your story. I think that is so, <laughs> so amazing and so cool. And I love that we've been able to connect. Yeah. So I, I similarly, I, it, it popped up one day, the movie popped up one day and I thought, okay, I'm going to watch this. And then I watched it again immediately right after that. And I started, it really started for me when my son was, had swim lessons. And I realized one day that I was looking forward to that time with my son and his swim lesson. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize, and I, I, I will admit, you know, the first couple of times this happened, I started to have guilt and some shame. Oh, well, I can't, I cannot be looking forward to something like my, my husband just died. I cannot. Right, right. Yeah. Cannot, cannot look forward to something. And then I would just find little things as you're talking about that I would notice, like a dragonfly would just come by and land on my arm or, you know, just something happens in my neighborhood. And sometimes it has literally been sunny and snowing at the same time or -hmm. sunny and raining. And just those little moments that make you pause and be a hundred percent present Mm-hmm. and go, okay, there is still something here left for me to see and appreciate right. in this life. And then I found as, as my grief process continued and I, my bad, I call them, you know, bad days, good days, like my good mm-hmm. days started to outnumber my bad days. I was starting to grasp more of what those little pieces of joy were left. Right. It's kind of, it's mind blowing when you look back on something and all of a sudden you can say, that's what happened. I love those parts of life because all the time it's happening, it's occurring. I'm experiencing it day after day after day after day, not really thinking about it. And now all of a sudden something like collateral beauty, those two words along with the movie and now two people in my life that have experienced it, they've labeled it. Finally, thank you. For letting me know what I was experiencing. Because I think it's due to that collateral beauty that I was able to move forward. And then one day, in all honesty, I was sitting having lunch with a friend. And I said, you know, I think I'm the happiest I've ever been in my entire life. That's so amazing. And I think it's just because my mind was more open to finding those bright, beautiful little spots, those little details, and realizing how many of them there are if you only open your eyes and open your mind. I agree. And I think a loss, as 
as big as what you've experienced and what I have experienced, Mm -hmm. it shifts. And I, and I talk to people and my therapists about this quite frequently of I'm different. There are certain things that are different. And just Mm -hmm. as I can notice these beautiful moments throughout life, Mm -hmm. I also, there are certain things that just, I don't care about as much anymore. I know that's kind of blunt as well. Um, but some of the trivial things that go through of life that people get yeah. all up in arms about, and I'm like, yeah. just, I kind exactly. of have a flat affect and I go, mm. and I think not getting caught up in that permits the space to have that joy to see and be present with yes. what really that beauty is that's left. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I can relate to what you just said. You know, somebody 30 years ago, if somebody cut in front of me at the grocery store checkout line. I'm, I would have been upset. I would have said something now. Here, go ahead. It's not worth worrying about. But I thought for a long time about this one moment of time somewhere, somehow, when consciously or subconsciously, I said to myself, I don't want to live like this anymore. And I don't even remember time frame, how long it was after Tom died. But there was a time when I said, I don't want to live like this anymore. And so I kind of shifted. Now, I didn't have a child. I didn't have a young one to kind of be my anchor at that point. I was living in the house totally alone. And I'm at an age where even to take care of a dog, even a cat, sometimes when you think about buying the cat food, schlepping at home and the cat litter and all that. Yeah, so I bought a bird. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it was a parrot. It, it, it was a conure. And I would let, her name was Phoebe. And I would let her out of the cage and silliest thing, she became one of my pieces of collateral beauty. And every morning I'd let her out of her cage and she would fly over and sit on my shoulder as I ate breakfast. You know, she might hop down on the table or something and just kind of look or try to snatch a bit of my food or something like that. I took such delight in that silly little bird. But the simplest things, when you feel that moment where you don't want to go on day after day after day like this anymore. You have to stand up and do something about it. Mm -hmm. You can't just push that thought aside. You have to find some motivation to get up and do something about it. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's work. Grief is work. It is. I think so often, especially with how society kind of conditions us around these emotions or negative emotions. I don't like calling them negative emotions. They're just part of the emotional spectrum, but we have to work through them. And the more that we bypass them or ignore them, I mean, it can wreak havoc on our body. It can Mm -hmm. wreak havoc on our mental state and, and our relationships. And, but it, and it does take work in those baby Mm -hmm. steps, but but you do, you have, I, I love that it starts with that decision. To right. say, I don't want this, this recognition of, I don't want this anymore. I don't. And it's scary too, because you don't know what the other side looks like. Mm-hmm. And you have to work. I call it sludge. You have to work through the sludge. You have yeah. to clear out that space, mm-hmm. but it's amazing on the other side. It it's is. just so freeing on the other side when you can freeing, actually work I, through I like those. that word. Yes, it is. How is your son doing? He is great. He keeps me on my toes. He's Uh almost four and he just, he cracks me up. We do have our, (laughs) we do have our moments. uh, And it's, it's definitely been quite a journey, but Mm -hmm. overall he's kind of my barometer and that's Mm -hmm. how I can tell. And, and I'll say most people who meet us don't know that we have dealt with such a tragedy and that brings me comfort because at least I know not again, not that we're hiding anything. No, it's no. just that um, I early on, I decided while this in, Sean's death has negatively impacted us, I was very resolute that it would not dictate us. Mm-hmm. And that was a big difference for me of we're going to talk about him. We're going to be honest about what's happened. He has asked what happened, what happened to his dad. Um, and we're going to take it head on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, he's, he's doing really, really well, thriving. Good. Good. Glad to hear it. And that says a lot about you as a mom. It really does. Whether you realize it or not. It does. It it does. One more thing I want to cover before we're, you know, that we're going to get to the end and have to wind down. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross came up with phases of grief. Now, 
initially they were intended for the person who was dying, but they kind of got adopted, if you will, by those left behind who were grieving. I, however, love from your book, you don't have that many faces. You only have three. Can you tell us what your faces are? I love them. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I have the first phase that I talk about is the shock and awe. So that's the immediacy of the loss. Mm -hmm. And just at that point in time, really, your nervous system is overtaken in your brain, right? We protect, we're protected by our brain in that shock phase. And so it's just straight survival. You're just getting through the day. Um, it, there's not not very much cognitive capacity i know for me by like noon one o'clock for most days initially mm -hmm. I, that was it i was spent i couldn't do very much right. your eating is impacted everything is just meant at that point in time to try and mm -hmm. keep you in that survival mode right and that that phase lasts different for every person mine was about four months and i it was a very marked time for when that shock lifted for me. Yeah. Um, very marked. And I went, Oh, now I'm being flooded with a lot of feelings. Right. Um, right. The now what phase is kind of what comes after that. And that's where I say you branch two different, almost two different lives that you have at that point in time, right? At that point in time, people have moved, moved on. They're going back to their daily lives. Right. Um, this thing happened to you, but, but for them, they, they know it happened to you, but they're going back to, to what they have to do. And then, but at the same time, at what, like while I was adulting and having to go back to work and make sure my son was taken care of, I had this massive grief journey ahead mm -hmm. of me and this mm -hmm. huge, Mary, I mean, emotions that I didn't even know I could feel all at once were right. coming for me. And so finding that balance, if you can, I don't know if there really is balance, but finding a way to navigate that the world has, has kept going. You're still like, for me, I was still stuck at my husband's death sure, sure. and then still had to figure out how to navigate my daily routine mm -hmm. with my son. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the now what, and then yes, the third phase as you and I have kind of talked about is finding that collateral beauty. It's finding those little pieces in life that give you hope and allow us to continue dreaming or even planning and looking at the type of future that we can have and, and how to make a sense of purpose for ourselves and maybe meaning out of the loss. I know that that's exactly why I'm here is this is, there's nothing good that comes from Sean dying, but maybe there can be some good that comes from my journey in the aftermath. And that's right. really taking those steps forward and continuing, right. continuing to embrace this life. Yeah. So I, I think that sums it up perfectly. The first phase is shock and awe. Second phase is now what? Now what? <laughs> and then the third is finding the collateral beauty. That sums it up in a nice little package. And I think will be much more, it'll resonate much more with a lot of people who are grieving, especially women, I believe. Um, they'll be able to relate to that much, much better, much easier. Well, here it is, sadly. <laughs> it's that time. And I hate it because I've truly loved chatting with you. It just means that our paths are going to cross again at some point and you may come back on the podcast or who knows, we may work together somewhere else. You never know. But before I wrap up, I do want to turn the microphone over to you, Alexandra, and let you speak directly to our listeners. Tell them whatever you want to tell them. Tell them where they can get your book, what other services you might offer, if you have a website, anything at all like that. Your turn. Oh, well, thank you. This has been such, such a pleasure. And, and this went by fast this time it did. <laughs> quickly. It did. Um, first, I just want to say, if you are going through any process like this, you can do this. I had someone very early on say that to me. I thought she was full of it, mm -hmm. uh, but she was right. And so, and you also can do this. Uh, so I do have a website. It's forwardtojoy.com. That's where you can find information about podcasts I've, I've been a guest on, the podcast that I host called The Widow's Club. Um, there's also ways to connect with me in regards to I do some one-on-one -on -one coaching where I do help individuals work through past grief in order to heal present grief. And, and it's basically an evaluation tool to really see what messages and conditions we've taken on as children that impact us as adults. So all that information is on the website. Um, you can reach out to me. My email is alexandra at forwardtojoy.com. And then I'm also on social media, mostly Instagram. I'm still, still learning all of these platforms that 
I'm on Instagram as well at, um, at forward to joy. So definitely reach out if you have any questions and this has just been a pleasure to connect with you today. Oh, great. Thank you so much. My pleasure indeed. So as always listeners, her contact information, her website, all that will be in the episode notes and on our website as well. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. I can't wait to finish your book. I, I kind of wanted to read really fast before I talk to you, but now I can go back and enjoy it more leisurely. It truly has become one of the books that I would recommend to someone who's going through this as well. I think they would take a lot of comfort in your story as well as in your your method, so to speak, of moving forward and trying to find that collateral beauty. So many, many thanks. Listeners, it's that time. I'm going to remind everyone to take care of yourselves. That is so, so important. And it can be the tiniest little thing, as one of our guests, John Polo, mentioned, just the people you surround yourself with can be a form of self-care. What you do, going for a walk, finding some time for introspection, any little thing like that that you do to focus on moving forward and getting through it. You're not going to get over it, but you can try to move forward and get through it. If you need help, please seek that help. If you need help and don't know how to start, reach out to me. I'll help you. I'll help you. I'll, I can connect you with a number of number of resources. So on that note, I'm going to say, please return. Please listen to the next episode. Stay safe. Take care of yourself. Blessings and love as we all continue to live and grieve. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.